Good morning, dobre jutro, dzień dobry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, let me join my Ukraine colleague in welcoming you all to this conference. Uh, before I give the floor to excellent, distinguished guests, uh, panelists, I would like to share with you a few thoughts that I hope will set the stage for upcoming uh, presentations and discussions. I must confess that I have been involved in central banking and related areas of policy making for quite some time. Through this time, I have accumulated a lot of experience, not only, and have read tons of reports, analysis, and papers, etc., which I have habit, I don't know, better or good of story. In the real moments of uh, peace and quiet, I enjoy taking a break and reading what we, the central banking community, have thought and written 10, 15, or 20 years ago. And it's really interesting. One starts to see things from different perspective and in a broader context. And it is on such a short tour for central banking history that I would like to take you for a moment. If we take a really long view, we'll notice that the central banks have been an integral part of the economic since the 17th century. Do you know that the first institution recognized as a central bank was Sweden's? I confer with my colleague, Risk Bank, founded in 1668. And the second, in 1694, who knows? Yes, you are true. Bank of England. And uh, the initial role was limited to providing war finance to governments and managing their debts. It was not until the mid-19th century that they became gradually oriented towards maintaining uh, economic growth and supporting financial stability. It was then in 1873 that Walter Budget published his famous book, Knows Lombard Street, now widely considered to be the first textbook on crisis management. He clearly identified that central banks as the only institutions that has both the capacity and the responsibility to prevent panic, financial panic, I mean. He also offered a prescription familiar to all those involved in the market operations that in crisis, the central bank should lend freely to stem the panic. This principle is still the cornerstone of modern central banks' response to financial stress. But budget genius was in recognizing very early on the goals of providing sustainable economic growth and financial stability are closely linked. He clearly stated that the problem of managing a panic must not be thought as a mainly a banking problem. It's primarily a mercantile one. This was supposed to mean that the financial crisis is so dangerous because it's likely to spill over to real economy. Nevertheless, I think it would be an exaggeration to say that there had been a clear theoretical consensus on the relative importance of price, economic, and financial stability. Views of these matters fluctuated with changing economic and potential, uh, political landscapes. Even as late as in 1965, uh, 68, sorry, Milton Friedman famously observed that although there was wide agreement at the time about the major goals of economic policy, for example, like high employment, state prices, and fast growth, there was much less agreement that these goals are mutually compatible and even less agreement about the role of the central bank in achieving them. A breakthrough finally came in the late 70s and 80s, just when Paul Volcker was busy applying his shock therapy and timing inflation 
A new macroeconomic mainstream was evolving that laid the foundation of the modern inflation targeting strategy. This is the new paradigm. On the one hand, stressed the cost of inflation, and on the other, provided scope for the central bank to impact aggregate demand via short-term nominal and real interest rates. Importantly, monetary transmission mechanism operated largely through macroeconomic aggregates with no major role for frictions in financial intermediation. And there was little or no role for money and credit in such models. Both variables were fully endogenous, carried no additional predictive for inflation, and thus could be largely discarded in setting interest rates. In other words, the new paradigm left no room for tension between monetary policy and financial stability. The two were assumed to be complementary. The central bank needed to worry only about ensuring price stability. If it succeeded, financial stability would be maintained as well. It's easy to criticize uh, these views exposed, but at the time, no one appeared any wiser. Not least because the new paradigm really did seem to be working. In a widely cited article, Oliver Brashard or John Simon documented that the variability of quarterly growth in the real output has declined by half since the mid 80s, while the variability of quarterly inflation has declined by about two thirds. This remarkable occurrence was termed great moderation, as you know, and central bankers were quick to accept credit for it. We know that uh, we know now that uh, this was premature to say mm, the least. The crisis that erupted almost a decade ago has taught us that thinking about macroeconomic stability only in terms of inflation and output gaps can be very misleading. And it certainly isn't any guarantee for financial stability. Just how hard this lesson has been for the world economy is the best illustrated by the fact that output in advanced economies is today more than 10% lower relative to pre-crisis uh, pre trend, and the outcomes in emerging economies are not much better. It is this loss in real wealth and generates some discontentment today with monetary policy, central banking, and inflation targeting. This disillusionment takes sometime, sometime, sometimes extreme, extreme forms. For example, some have suggested that a return to a 100% reserve system claiming that it would not only make the financial system safer, but would also increase real output by 10%. Others would rather go a different way and effectively merge monetary and fiscal policy, perhaps even doing uh, with the central bank in its present form together, altogether. While I uh, appreciate such thought experiments, I think it's actually more constructive to think in terms of uh, improvements to the current framework that can realistically be put in place to help economy to keep uh, the economy on the path of sustainable economic growth. Such Constructive thinking always has to start by reviewing solid and undisputed facts. The first fact, uh, the key fact, which finds overwhelming support in the literature, is that both high and variable inflation and significant deflation can have very high economic costs. The second key fact, confirmed in particular by recent uh, history, is that even sustainable price stability is no guarantee for economic and financial stability. And the third key fact, again supported by ample theoretical empirical evidence, is that major economic and financial crises tend to be preceded by the rapid rates of growth of money and credit supply. Against such background, let me now sketch out how I see the role of the central bank in the post-crisis world. First, I believe, I'm sure, that central bank should remain independent and tasked with maintaining price stability. It is the one undisputed contribution that they can make to long economic growth. But the price stability mandate should be defined over the medium term to allow for a sufficient degree of 
flexibility in responding to shocks. This flexible approach means that the central bank does not strive to keep, in, to keep inflation on target at all times. Rather, it means that each time a shock materializes, policymakers can determine the optimal time frame for bringing inflation to target. Second, I believe that central banks should stay playing important loan in safeguarding financial stability. The Ukraine example clearly indicates that the central bank can adopt a wider mandate and can cover micro and macro supervision, even resolution. This hardly needs elaboration here in Ukraine where my colleagues have been very successful in cleaning up the banking system to safeguard financial stability. Although precise institutional arrangements can vary, can vary from country to country, it goes without saying that the central bank is the only institution that can play the role of lender of last resort. The simple reason for that is the central bank, as the monopoly provider of legal tender, is the only institution not threatened but illiquidity in domestic currency. Thus, it's also the only institution that can ensure the smooth functioning of the payment system, which among others, as you know, uh, is the platform for transmission of monetary policy. Let me give you a concrete example for um, how this responsibility for financial stability can be capped with broader monetary policy goals by quoting, again from MEF, by quoting National Bank of Poland's monetary policy guidelines. And uh, our Monetary Policy Council explicitly states that monetary policy will be conducted in a way that fosters financial stability. Finally, Humbled by experience of the recent past, I do recognize that even through monetary policy should be conducted in a way that supports the stability of financial system, this is not always easy to do in practice. After all, the recent uh, crisis and the output loss that resulted from were trigger, uh, triggered mainly by excessive leverage, underpricing, risk, a uh, gradual built up of debt and extreme reliance on short term funding. None of this can be easily dealt with using the central bank's short-term interest rate alone, especially given uh, free movement of capital and highly integrated financial markets. Thus, monetary policy should be complemented by macroprudential policy. Again, the exact institutional arrangement in which this policy coordination is done is probably less important than the fact that it is done at all. This is because macroprudential policy has the capacity to selectively influence credit aggregates above all mortgage loans and thus stabilizing, stabilize lending growth for, with lower costs for economic growth than monetary policy. Finally, summing up, I believe that the independent central bank oriented towards maintaining price stability and safeguarding financial stability has a crucial role to play in supporting balanced economic growth. Clearly, clearly uh, central banks cannot solve all the world's economic problem. In particular, monetary policy can be a substitute for structural reforms and sound fiscal policy. However, central banks are uniquely equipped to create an environment in which development enhancing changes can take place. I deeply believe it. I would like to conclude by wishing you all insightful and stimulating discussion. Thank you very much for very good cooperation with our colleagues from the Central Bank of Ukraine. Thank you for your attention.